Good morning and welcome to Woodlawn United Church's worship moment for April the 29th, Wednesday. I want to begin today as I usually do on Wednesdays with uh, announcing some of the deaths of people in our congregation and connected to folks in our congregation. And today I have four folks to mention. Uh, Carl Trider, Don Trider's younger brother, passed away. Maud Welsh, a longtime member of Woodlawn. Jean Riage, and just last night, Jerry Jackson lost his dad. So would you pray with me now for a moment? Spirit of God, loving, benevolent force at the heart of the universe, we especially ask you to be with the families of all of these folks today who have lost their loved ones. It's such a difficult time for us, uh, not able to grieve properly. Be with us, especially in this time, and we give you thanks, O God, that in life, in death, in life beyond death, you are always with us. Also today, God, please speak through my theological reflection, a word of hope that people may hear. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So, today I want to talk with you about the difference between apocalyptic writings in the Bible and prophetic writings in the Bible. And often these two things get confused. And I want to begin with a, a part of the Bible that's often called the Little Apocalypse, and it's from the Gospel of Mark chapter 13, and it goes like this. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what a magnificent building. Do you see these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Later, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when these things will happen. What will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Anxious about the future. We know a little bit about asking questions about when things will happen in the future. And Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and may deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still yet to come. Nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These will be but birth pains. You must be on your guard. You must think critically, if you will. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in synagogues. And account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the, but the gospel must be preached to all nations first. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, don't worry about what you're going to say. Just say whatever is given to you at that time, for it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit through you. Brother is going to be betray brother and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it doesn't belong, let the, leader, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down and enter the house and take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it would be for those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this won't take place in winter because those will be day of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short these days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, here he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I told you ahead a time everything. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. 
the stars will fall from the sky and heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn the lesson of the fig tree. As soon as the twigs get tender and the leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you, uh, you will know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. May God speak to us through this reading of Holy Scripture. But what a weird reading. What a weird reading. In 1972, on my very first Bible class, one of the things I learned about was the difference between prophecy and apocalyptic writings in the Bible. And I've been thinking about that difference in the last few weeks as a result of some of the phone calls and discussions on the phone that I've been having with people in our congregation. On a couple of occasions, at least, congregational members have asked me about my thoughts on things like the end of the world, the second coming of Christ, because I think there was even a report of locusts re recently and earthquakes and of course, pandemics. The pandemics, the pandemic has brought all these things to their mind. And if nothing else like that old REM song, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine, you know. For those of us who follow lectionary readings each Sunday, the only time we ever really get to talking about these kind of things is at the end of the liturgical church year, right around the time of the Reign of Christ Sunday at the end of November. And some years, we actually have either that Sunday or the next Sunday, we have a reading from this passage in Mark 13 that I just read you. Most of the time, we ignore those biblical passages that seem to refer to these things unlike some other evangelical preachers who have whole TV shows dedicated to predicting the future and trying to scare the hell out of you. So let me say clearly, I think that those programs on TV that I just referred to and books like the Left Behind series or the one that was popular 40 years ago that I first read by Hal Lindsey called The Late Great Planet Earth are bull loney. They they're not something I subscribe to at all. But, you know, the Bible is very relevant to our lives because it's a vehicle through which God can speak to us and because it reflects patterns of behavior in individuals and in societies that reoccur over and over again. And so often, you know, even though you didn't plan it, a lectionary reading on a Sunday can relate exactly to what's happening in our lives and in the world on any particular day. But... And I say this to people in confirmation classes. The Bible is not a crystal ball like the writings of Nostradamus with specific predictions about our future. Let me say that again. The Bible is not a crystal ball. So back to the differences between prophecy and apocalyptic. My Bible for Professor at Acadia when I went there, Dr. Perkin, began by telling us that the modern usage of the word prophet is very different from how biblical scholars use it. We seem, we talk about prophets as people who really are fortune tellers, whereas biblical prophecy, according to scholars, is more often than not somebody who warns those in authority and gives them a chance to make a change. There's usually a conditional clause in their prophecies. They would say things like, if, O oh Israel, you turn from your idolatry and your corruption, then you'll be okay. But if you don't, if you continue to worship idols, if you continue to be corrupt in your business practices, then God is going to punish you and you'll get it in the neck. You know, there's always an if-then part to it. You know, if then, uh, if you do, great. If you don't, you're going to be taken off into exile. There was indeed a future component in their teaching, but it was usually based on extrapolation into the future from patterns of behavior in the past and a keen awareness of what was happening in the present. Kind of like uh, our weather forecasters, for example, 
who look at the patterns as they're coming up the coast and they know how things are going and if it continues that way then this is going to happen for the weather in the next few days or modern day prophets like David Suzuki for example who's been warning us for years about climate change and we haven't been listening right if we don't make some changes then this is going to happen and we still are in that phase in terms of climate change you know and uh, you know and this brings us to apocalyptic though in the time of prophecy there's a chance to make a difference and to change things in apocalyptic times it's too late we are in the midst of it and the main message in that time period is hold on tight to that bucking bronco as sooner or later we're going to get off and it'll be okay but meanwhile hold on tight the message is don't lose your faith in god for although we can't avoid this current crisis god eventually will bring restoration just as god has in the past god will bring life out of death resurrection will have the last word and all things will be okay and maybe even better than before the apocalyptic crisis time the apocalyptic writings often can be sure of this in the bible because uh, they were written at a different time than they say they were written you know for example the book of daniel was written about 175 years before christ during the time of the maccabean persecution a particularly bad time for jews in israel uh, but it was written as if it was written 500 years earlier in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And partly that was for safety reasons, but also it was also to show that just as God had brought them through all these things in the past, God was going to bring them through the, per the current crisis that they were in when the book was actually written. Similarly, this book of this reading from the Gospel of Mark that I read today uh, was written you know, uh, right around 68, 70 AD, just as the siege of Jerusalem was happening by the Romans. Uh, when they came in, they destroyed the city and they destroyed the temple that, it, that Jesus talks about in, at the beginning of this reading, uh, just as he says they will. And so when this was written, it had already happened or was just about to happen. You know? And so there's a, a certain amount of uh, assurance that this was uh, uh, going to happen because in many cases it, is a, it had already happened. You know? The key to understanding apocalyptic writings is not the future, but the past. You know? That's where we can really understand these writings. And they are relevant today and to our present and future because the message is really the same. God is going to be with us and it's all going to be okay in the end. Often apocalyptic writing, writings are so uh, ambiguous because they're written very highly symbolic because kind of like, you know, uh, people passing messages during World War II, they're written highly in code. You know, uh, the beast 666 was actually, uh, people think was probably the Emperor Nero way back when, who was particularly uh, persecuting uh, Christians and ended up uh, uh, crucifying both Peter and Paul. You know, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the beast, all these hybrid creatures with wings and, and lion's heads and everything else. It's all kind of weird, symbolic stuff. But it's written in code just for that reason, because it's written in a time of extreme persecution. And people that are writing it don't want the authorities to come back on them, you know. So in terms of this pandemic, I would suggest to you we are more in an apocalyptic time than in a prophetic time. At least, I think it's too late to avoid it. We're in the middle of it. And so the apocalyptic message is the same today as it was for other people at different times in the Bible. Hold on tight. We will get through this just as the people of God have in the past. So don't lose your faith in God. God is always with us, even if sometimes we may not feel God really strongly because we're so stressed out. God did not cause this suffering, but the benevolent force that is at the heart of the universe that we call God can bring new life out of this, bring new things that may even be better than this old pre-pandemic pre normal that we remember not too long ago. Hope and life 
have the final word today. God's kingdom is coming and indeed is already here in, in so many ways in which we care for one another and express the love of God as church and, in, and as community. In the book of Daniel, Daniel has faith in God when the king throws him into the lion's den. He says, God will protect me. I won't worship you, King Nebuchadnezzar. You know? uh, and God does. But for me, the real heroes of the stories in the book of Daniel are three Jews called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what they say to the king is, you know, you can throw us into the fiery furnace if you want, and our God will save us. But even if God doesn't save us, we will still believe in God and we will not worship you. You know, that was a kind of real faith. There is hope, there is new life, there is salvation. In this life or the next, God is with us. Amen.